Okay, I'm going to play the women's health lecture. Just a couple of things. The objectives in this lecture don't 100% match the objectives in your hard copy that I uploaded. I made a few changes from fall to spring to just make it a little bit more comprehensive. So when you're listening to this, lecture notes are the exact same thing, but I just made the objectives a little more specific. All right, we're gonna talk about chapter 18 and 19, women's health. So here are your learning outcomes. So we're gonna talk about screenings across the lifespan, physical and psychological aspects of menopause, and medical and complementary therapies and the care of the woman with osteoporosis. So your screenings are your breast cancer screenings, and I want you to focus on that age 40 age group. Um, breast cancer screening, early detection when the tumor is small, but hasn't, provide, um, hasn't spread, provides the best outcome. Um, ages 40 to 49 yearly, ages 50 to 64 every two years, and also I want you to know ages 65 and older every two years up into age 74. So I want you to know those age groups for the breast cancer screening. Again, 40 to 49 yearly. They may do it earlier if there is a history or if they find any lumps or are suspicious of anything. 50 to 64 every two years and 65 and older every two years to 74. Cervical screening, 21 to 29, pap test every three years, 30 to 65 um, every five with the HPV, and 65 and older can stop the pap if no precancerous cells are found in the previous 20 years. Women who had a total hysterectomy should stop screening unless the hysterectomy was due to cervical precancer or, or cancer. And the CDC recommends that everyone between the ages of 13 and 64 get a test for HIV. And you probably have realized that when you go for your physicals and your physicians probably are asking for that. So some changes that you want your patients to be aware of. Any suspicious lump of any type. It could just be um, fibrocystic breast disease or um, just changes due to menstruation or, or hormones, but any lump, skin dimpling, changes in the skin color or texture on the breast, change in how the nipple looks like pulling in of the nipple, and any leakage, clear or bloody fluid from the nipple. So your menopause is broken into three groups perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. So menopause is usually starts in the 40s, the perimenopause, I mean, and it may last for about eight years. The woman may just have irregular menstrual cycles, may have her menstrual cycle one month, three months later, have another one, another one, every month after that for another six months, and then every three months. Um, but in the perimenopause cycle, the woman still can become pregnant. Menopause is defined as the cessation of menstruation for one solid year. So if a woman has had no menstruation for 12 months for one full year, that is true menopause. Unless there's something else going along, but if, that, if, if she's in that age group. Postmenopause is the time after menopause. And signs and symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, mood changes, sexual dysfunction. The woman may experience hair loss, thinning of hair, dry skin, loss of skin elasticity, uh, irregular heartbeat and palpitations. The treatment is lifestyle changes, alternative, and then we'll talk about some medication. So lifestyle is just basically what we always tell everyone, get lots of sleep, drink lots of water, exercise, avoid caffeine, limit your alcohol, avoid smoking, and keep a, um, a normal weight. That's what we tell everybody, right? And then alternatives, black cohash is your, uh, is a, 
uh, herbal supplement, acupuncture, biofeedback, hypnosis. Medical therapy will be treated with menopausal hormonal therapy. A lot of conflicting research. So I always tell the patients to speak with their healthcare provider and determine what is best for them. Uh, it used to be called hormonal replacement therapy. Uh, estrogen therapy is for women without a uterus and estrogen and progesterone is uh, for women with a uterus. And then you have your progesterone only. So um, estrogen therapy is never given alone to a woman with a uterus in oral therapies. <coughs> Excuse me. Big, 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 important, important, flash, flash, flash. Make sure you know the estrogen therapy contraindication. Think back to what you knew about contraceptives and what you know about contraceptives goes along with estrogen therapy contraindications. Unexplained vaginal bleeding. I think a lot of people miss that on, on exam too. Unexplained vaginal bleeding is one because it's a, it's a sign of cancer or something is going on, especially in the postmenopausal woman. In a postmenopausal woman, if she has unexplained vaginal bleeding, there's a high chance it's some type of a reproductive cancer. Liver and gallbladder disease, blood clotting disorders, history of any pulmonary embolisms, hypertension, or any reproductive cancers, uterine cancer, breast cancer. So this should sound really familiar to when you were learning about contraindications contra with, um, with, con with your um, oral contraceptive agents. Specific treatments um, for hot flashes, night sweats, uh, sleep disturbances, sexual dysfunction, and physiological issues. Uh, psychological aspects, a lot of women in their, their pre or their menopausal state find themselves also in an empty nesting state. So not only is their body going through all these changes, they've gone from being a caregiver to being solely by themselves or caring for aging parents. They ha they, a lot of women have a really hard time accepting this and coping with this. And then with the symptoms on top of it, it really can cause a lot of depression. And we already talked about the, the hot flashes and, and the, the palpitations, but the changes in the muscular, skeletal, and skin system are really important. Once a woman goes into menopause, it increases her risk for osteoporosis, really important. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more about osteoporosis. Um, she has collagen and elastin weakness and the weight distribution changes. You see a change in the cardiovascular system. So you see an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and cholesterol issues, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and changes in cognitive function as well. So osteoporosis, what is osteoporosis? It's a decrease or a loss of bone mass. When more bone mass is absorbed, than what is being created. So these women are at higher, higher risk for getting osteoporosis after menopause. And as they age and as they have increased risk for falls, they have an increased risk for fractures, especially of the hip. And I'm sure you hear that a lot in your older adults. They come in with, with broken with um, hip fractures. How are we diagnosing this? They're diagnosing with what's called a DEXA scan. And this DEXA scan is going to measure the bone density. This is a whole host of risk factors for osteoporosis. So we talked about most of these already. So a woman who is thin is more at risk for osteoporosis than a heavier woman. Family history, certain medications. Look at your medications, your corticosteroids chemotherapy, anticonvulsants, vitamin D deficiency, big, lifetime, uh, low lifetime intake of calcium. So tr prevention and treatment is maintaining an adequate calcium intake 
vitamin D supplementation, estrogen affecting, uh, effective in preventing osteoporosis, engaging in those weight-bearing exercises, get them to the gym, avoid alcohol and smoking, so we're just ruining their lives there. Risks of medical therapy is breast cancer and thromboembolytic disease, because what we said with the estrogen and progesterone and increased risk for stroke. Medical therapy for osteoporosis benefits is its most effective therapy for moderate to severe, and it's effective for prevention of fractures related to osteoporosis. Different types of medications, oral, transdermal, topical, and vaginal ring and they may add testosterone. So the, uh, the DEXA, DEXA scan is done. It's gonna measure the bone density at the hip and the lumbar spine, and prevention is key. So it's recommended at all postmenopausal post women greater than 65 or postmenopausal women with fractures or less than 65 with one or more risk factors should be screened. The medical therapy for osteoporosis is your medications called your biphosphonates. And what they do is they are inhibiting the reabsorption of bone. So you're gonna see a lot of GI and esophageal issues with this. So the key important things here I want you to know is your medication is your biphosphonates, your al aldronate, or your Fosamax. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this from Med Surge. They're gonna take this first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, 30 minutes before breakfast. Take it with water and stay in an upright sitting or standing position for 30 minutes. So this is one of those medications that if you're working night shift, you're giving this medication before you give report to the day shift nurses. Estrogen receptor modulators, they bind with the estrogen receptors and reduce the reabsorption. Side effects are um, DVTs, clots, leg cramps, and stroke. Doesn't sound really good. And your uh, medication is raloxifene or Evista. And then you can go with the hormone therapy, which would be the conjugated estrogen, and the um, known as Prem phase, and it's prescribed for a woman who have a uterus and contraindicated with women known with suspected estrogen dependent neoplasias. Again, be really careful with those hormone dependent cancers. So you wanna talk about the risk factors, talk about doing um, exercise, weight bearing, fall prevention, foods high in calcium and vitamin D and discuss key things about the medication, especially like your phosphates, where they want to take that 30 minutes before getting up with, with nothing but by you know, no meal or anything, water, sitting upright for 30 minutes prior. All right, that was pretty much it for chapter 18. Now we're going to go on to chapter 19, which is alterations in women's health. So we're gonna talk about various menstrual disorders and we're gonna talk about alternations in women's health, including medical management and nursing actions. The one thing I wanna talk about is hysterectomy. Um, several different types of hysterectomy you have, uh, which is basically a surgical removal of the, of the uterus. You have a total abdominal hysterectomy, which is a surgery and it, it's major surgery. They're, going, they're making an incision. They can do a total vaginal hysterectomy where they're going through the vagina and they can do a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, which has actually the highest um, recovery rate. They can a lot of times have that same day or leave the next day. The uh, total abdominal is preferred when cancer is suspected and some advantages to a vaginal earlier ambulation less pain, um, less anesthesia, um, and visible scars and blood loss. And the removal of ovaries at the same time is kind of controversial depending on, it's, they, they talk with the docs and, and you and 
what are some of the biopsies that they found and, and they, they do a case by case um, decision. A DNC is indicated maybe diagnostic or therapeutic, sometimes after a hysterectomy, also known, uh, also can do what's known as an endometrial ablation. And an endometrial ablation is not recommended for women who desire pregnancy. And it also may be done after an incomplete abortion or a miscarriage. Done under general anesthesia, and it can be done outpatient or inpatient. Dysmenorrhea just basically means painful menstruation. It occurs when the menstruation starts and it ends when the menstruation ends. Treatments are contraceptives, anti-inflammatory, self-care measures, which we're going to talk about, rest, heat, and nutrition. So premenstrual syndrome, it occurs in about 20 to 40% of women. It occurs after ovulation, before menses, and, and it can occur in three, in three consecutive menstrual cycles. So some important concepts here with care for PMS, you wanna identify what's causing it. They may have the patient keep a diary of what they've eaten, what they've done, and prior to, during, and after. Some dietary restrictions, maybe avoiding alcohol, nicotine, red meat, fats, and any type of salt or sugary foods. Adding calcium, B6, magnesium, and vitamin E, and implementing exercise. And also yoga, all different types of walking, relaxation. So this pretty much talks about the same thing that I said, getting a good night's sleep. And I think I could talk about everything else as far as PMS. So good diet, maintain your normal weight, exercise, weight bearing exercises, sleep, avoid all those bad things, drugs and alcohol, right? Endometriosis is the presence of endometrial tissue outside the uterus. And it can go, it can be anywhere. In, in the body, but the most common location is the pelvis. And the woman gets the uh, areas where the endometriosis are, the endometrial tissue also kind of bleeds along with the pregnant, along the, with the menstruation. So it is, the, the pain can be severe. It can lead to infertility, abnormal bleeding, and severe pelvic pain. So diagnostic is they do lapros um, a laparoscopy and treatment could be uh, medications or they can go in as well and do the ablation and do different, you know, go in and um, see what's going on and do any lysis of adhesions or anything that's, that's in there. Kind of a talk, uh, severe would be if they really, if they if, is do a hysterectomy. All right, we're going to talk about your STIs, your sexually transmitted infections, and we'll talk about what they are, diagnosis, treatment, and education. So the first one is trichomonas, trichomoniasis. Bacterial organism is trichomonas vaginalis. It's transmitted by sexual intimacy, and it can be asymptomatic or when it's symptomatic, the patient will have, you know, or especially in the male, a yellow to green frothy odor this discharge, a lot of vulvar itching and painful urination. Treatment is metrodiazole and both partners need to avoid intercourse until cured. And remember we talked about some of the, the things that can cause the, um, uh, perinatal uh, loss or fetal demise is some of your sexually transmitted diseases as well. And there is a picture of it underneath a slide. Next one is chlamydia. Chlamydia is transmitted by vaginal sex. 70% of the women are asymptomatic. So there's a lot of women walking around who have it and do not know it. They can have thin mucopurulent discharge and this can cause um, problems with fertility. Treatment is azithromycin. You can tell I'm getting tired. I've been, this is my third recording today. Or doxycycline. 
your doxy is contraindicated in pregnancy. Both partners um, are to avoid intercourse until cured, and it can cause chlamydial conjunctivitis during pregnancy. So it is also one of the sexually transmitted diseases that the erythromycin eye ointment is used for. Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is transmitted by vaginal, anal, and oral sex. Again, 80% are asymptomatic. Green penile discharge. Obtain information about the client's recent sexual experiences. The treatment is antibiotic, and it's with ceftrioxone, um, IM, if pregnant. And both partners, again, need to be avoiding intercourse until cured. If a pregnant woman becomes infected after the third month, the infection remains localized until the rupture of membranes. So the newborn is exposed to this infection during, during delivery through the birth canal. So that is, again, why all of our babies receive the erythromycin eye ointment as a, as a prophylactic. Herpes simplex. It's a viral organism, whoops, uh, transmitted vaginal, anal, and oral skin to skin with an infected site, and it can have devastating effects on the newborn. Diagnosis is based on appearance and symptoms, flu-like and genital pruritus, and treatment is oral acyclovir, no known cure, and palliative treatment. And teaching, you wanna make sure that the patients know that although they are asymptomatic, they can still be shedding the virus and that he or she can, is still contagious and can transmit the genital herpes. A syphilis is transmitted vaginal, oral, and anal. And exposure to the exudate from infected individuals. Transplacental. So, um, they do testing in most of the states and it can cause neonatal death and anomalies. Early stages, chancre appears, fever, weight loss, and malaise. In second stages, you can see the, um, the, the condylomata on the vulva and acute arthritis, enlargement of the liver, spleen, and lymph nodes and the patient can complain of chronic sore throat with hoarseness. Diagnosis, you wanna, you wanna get it early, and the treatment is penicillin. HPV is a viral organism in the cervix and the anorectal, and it leads to anorectal cancers, transmitted by vaginal, oral, and anal sex and symptoms are painless genital warts and itching. The treatment is, depends on what's going on, wart removal, surgical removal, and preventative measures through vaccines such as Gardasil and, Cer and Cervex. And there is a picture for you. Cervical cancer, it's the 16th leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women. It has been significantly decreased due to the pap smear. The, the, before that, um, we saw a, a higher number in this. HPV is, contributes to cervical cancer. It's very slow growing, very asymptomatic in the beginning. And as it, as it gets worse, vaginal discharge, pink or brown or bloody or foul-smelling vaginal discharge, abnormal vaginal bleeding, especially after menopause, key thing there, after menopause, weight loss, fatigue, pelvic, back, or leg pain. Treatment is based on the staging, and generally, if it's, if it's pretty invasive, it's surgery, chemo, and radiation. I would revisit the teaching ways to manage side effects for radiation therapy. So think about time, distance, and shielding and importance of skin care. So I would go back to table 19.5, I believe it's 19.5 and 19.6 on chemo and radiation. Endometrial cancer, second most common cause of cancer, of female rep reproductive signs and symptoms 
our postmenopausal bleeding, ding, 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 told you that it keeps coming up, abnormal vaginal discharge, painful urination, and pelvic pain and pressure. Treatment is, again, based on the extensiveness of the cancer and, again, be chemo or surgery, chemo, and radiation, and sometimes hormonal therapy. Um, ovarian cancer develops generally over the age of 60, 63. The symptoms are very vague and they resemble things that we normally have. So pressure in the pain, abdomen, pelvis, swollen or bloated abdomen, urinary frequency, full feeling. Treatment is surgery, chemo, and radiation. And that is the end of the women's health lecture.